Uh, do you uh, think the state is uh, careful not to create too much uncertainty with their fear in order to uh, hurt their income, basically? <laughs> Uh, I, I think the state usually uh, uh, creates fear as a package along with some kind of program or promise to alleviate the threat. Uh, at minimum, they will assure us that they are working on it very hard and it's just a matter of a short while before they get a handle on it. Okay? So uh, I, I don't think they want us to simply be uncertain. Uh, the subtitle of this book uh, is, is Fear, Ideology, and the Growth of Government. And uh, they need not just the fear, but they need us to all subscribe to the ideology that causes us to look to government as our savior. Uh, that's what most people have uh, believed in this country for a hundred years or so. It goes back to the progressive era when for the first time masses of people be became persuaded that the federal government in particular uh, is and should be and can be effectively uh, their, their savior of first resort. And uh, politics has operated on that basis almost entirely th uh, that way for the past century. If we, if we didn't think that, if, if we had the typical ideological outlook of people in the 1840s, for example, and uh, federal officials announced that there's some grave threat and they're going to take care of it, well, we would just laugh and <laughs> say, well, you know, fat chance that you clowns can take care of it. Uh, you know, we're going to have to get on this and take care of it ourselves. Or maybe the local government can help out or, you know, somebody we can... Have a, have a handle on here, but they certainly didn't expect the federal government to do very much to solve their problems uh, in the 19th century until toward the end uh, people began to move in that direction uh, with the intellectuals goading them uh, to do so. Here's a question. I was wondering if you think uh, we might be, just judging from what we see around us that we might be in the intermediate stages here of the formation of a police state. I mean, the parallels to this in 1938 Germany, along with the words like fatherland and homeland and all the different agencies that are being set up, by the way, with the help of people that used to be Nazis. I mean, do you think we're in the stages, uh, early stages, or inter even intermediate stages of a police state formation? I think this country is well along to being a police state right now. Uh, uh, when you look at the surveillance measures, uh, when you look at the claims the federal government is making, uh, in <clears throat> the president has virtually declared himself not subject to the laws of the land. Uh, he's said in so many lawyers' words of lawyers on his staff and in the Justice Department that as a unitary executive uh, and commander-in-chief, he will do whatever he thinks necessary for national security. Anything. He'll do anything. He, and, and he's written signing statements on scores of acts. Uh, when he signed them, supposedly signing them into law, He's also written provisos on there that he doesn't, doesn't necessarily hold himself to be responsible for enforcing them. <laughs> so uh, it, it, the, the fact that people have accepted this from the president, to me, is still mind-boggling. I, I thought people had more spunk in this country than that. I thought at least some of the, some of the Democrats that have been strong supporters of civil liberties would just denounce that to the heavens. And a few of them have, to their great credit. But this has never been a big issue. Most people don't even know anything about these signing statements. And yet this has been one of the principal pillars of building the power of the so-called unitary executive for Bush. And if you, if you have a person who's not bound to obey the law of the land or the Constitution or anything else, you simply got a, a dictatorship. Uh, it's an, an electoral dictatorship. I, I really do expect that Bush will step down at the end of his term, but 
if, if these precedents are used by the next occupant of the office, which they well may be, that's been the tendency in the past, that once one president has pushed the powers of the presidency out, successors have tended to exploit those powers, then, then we simply have a dictatorship in this country with elections, with all, you know, the kind of rigging of those. I'm not a believer in the democratic process, as it, certainly as it exists in this country. I think it's a fraud and a, a sham and a disgrace and a joke. But uh, we still have these elections, and somebody's elected, and he becomes president, and then he becomes dictator, as things now stand. These people can make war when they want to. Uh, they can lock anybody up they want to. They don't have to charge them if they don't feel like it. They can, uh, they can uh, hurry them off to Guantanamo or to some hidden prison somewhere. It's entirely up to them. They, there's no recourse whatsoever. Neither the person apprehended nor any, anybody else can do anything about it. And that's not a free society. Uh, but it goes far beyond that. The, the, the police state aspects of this country go all the way down to the local level. I mentioned my courthouse and the thugs at the door. That's, that's the case all the way across the country. We've, be, we've become a society of armed thugs, uh, police for the most part, and uh, they're, they're arresting people for things that shouldn't be crimes. We've got hundreds of thousands of pe people in prison now who, who committed crimes that harm no one. Uh, they shouldn't ever have been crimes in the first place, but there they are. Uh, we, we, we've got uh, jihads like uh, the DEA going after doctors for prescribing pain medicine. Uh, I had a, just a powerful article in my journal a couple of years ago on that, that uh, very inauspicious uh, development. And most people don't know about this. Uh, but uh, I, I, I am convinced that what we have left, you know, we don't have a 100% police state. We can still do things. I can still stand here and say these things to you, and no one has burst in to club me. Uh, so there, there's freedom of speech uh, in a way, but there's not complete freedom of speech because if you want to go out and hold up a placard when the president comes to town, the police will shoo you away from his route and confine you to an area and and they arrest you if you go out and try to show your placard anywhere else. That's happened over and over. Uh, so uh, people's speech rights have certainly been constrained, and uh, they've certainly been chilled as well. We all know now that these uh, surveillance measures being taken uh, by the intelligence agencies, the armed forces, uh, cover us all. They're not choosing people or they're not getting warrants to investigate people for a reasonable suspicion of crime. They're trolling through the internet and through the telephone system and they're just eating up data and doing what they feel like with it. Uh, we don't even know when it's being trolled. They've, they've created something called national security letters, which are, are self-issued warrants. Self-issued warrants. You, you, a government official who wants to arrest me or search my house doesn't have to go to a judge and say, look, judge, here's evidence that Higgs is, has committed a crime or that, that, that he's about to commit a crime and we want to search his, his house. Uh, they just sit down and sign a paper that, that's their own warrant to come and search my house. And the next thing you know, the FBI is searching my house. Or they're going, they're going to uh, an employer and, and they're saying, we, we want every, everything you have information about Higgs. And, and furthermore, uh, by law, you may not tell Higgs or anyone else, including a lawyer, that we've been here and got this information from you. Talk about suppression of free speech. This is a direct order given to people. And, and this isn't like a handful of national security letters. They've issued tens of thousands of these things. And every time they collect this information in this way, people's speech is totally suppressed. They're ordered, and they will be guilty of a felony if they speak of what's happened. And then they'll be punished. So if that isn't a police state, I don't know what is a police state. You know, we need to remember that, that a after the end of World War II, when, when people went out and did studies among the German people and asked them you know, what it was like to live under tyranny, most of them didn't know they'd lived under tyranny. 
They didn't think they had lived under tyranny. They just thought, you know, they had a government, and yeah, good, good citizens obey the government, and, and then we were in war, and when you're at war, you defend your country. They didn't know the Hitler government was tyranny or dictatorship. You think we're going to know when we have tyranny or dictatorship? We all go around here whistling past the graveyard all the time. It's a free country. It's a free country. Crap, it's a free country. <laughs> this hasn't been a free country in decades. Uh, not even close. We're subject to countless uh, officials investigating us, spying on us, uh, imprisoning us, arresting us for things that ought never to happen. Ought never to happen. And yet they happen routinely. Uh, and and uh, when I go around and give talks to people about this, uh, sometimes, particularly if it's a specially upscale bourgeois crowd, uh, first of all, they consider lynching me. And, uh, <coughs> and, and, and because they're upscale bourgeois people, they don't do that. Uh, they take violent offense, uh, and, and, and they, they simply cannot imagine that their government would ever harm them in any way. Because, of course, upscale bourgeois people, especially the ones that vote for Bush, no, they're not going to be molested in any direct uh, way that the people are aware of. Their data and their phone calls and their emails and all that are still fair game. But the government doesn't care about them. That's their supporters. I'm not going to molest them. Uh, think about all these guys that have been arrested as so-called uh, terrorists in this country. You know, like the, the guys in Miami who were supposedly plotting to blow up the Sears Tower. Yeah. Or the guy who was supposedly going to bring down the Brooklyn Bridge with a blowtorch. Yeah. Think, think about this. They have big news conferences in which the Attorney General of the United States comes out and announces these apprehensions. He can breathe freer now. These things are absurd. They're, they're hilarious almost. Because they go out and they, 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 they find some poor, feeble-minded people. They, they put an informant among them. They, 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 they plant some ideas. They give them some combat boots. Uh, and the next thing you know, they've got a case. And the, these, these poor guys have been arrested and hauled off to prison. Uh, that's our government at work. Uh, that's just fraud. That's just fake. They want to make us think they're on the job. And the trouble is they are on the job. It's the job that's the problem. Comment, if, yeah, it's okay. comment if you will, on uh, non-government fear mongers. And by this, we could take Al Gore or we could take anyone in the gun control industry. Mm -hmm. Their relationship with the state and their relationship with the media. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a lot of interest groups that are not uh, formal parts of the government do try to, to uh, monger fear uh, of all kinds. And uh, of, often it's a clear kind of lobbying tactic. Okay? Uh, teachers want us to be afraid of a, an educational crisis. Uh, people want it, of all sorts want us to be afraid of crime waves. You know, anytime three guys are shot in a row, there's a crime way, ra wave, or you know, if, if several women are raped, there's a serial rapist out there, uh, and uh, the newspapers make hay, and the TV makes hay. Uh, but there are people who make their living off of the response to these things. So if you're uh, if if you're in a public school teacher, you'd like the people to be afraid of an educational crisis. If you're if you're uh, uh, somebody who works for the court system, you want people to think there's a, a drug ep epidemic and we need to arrest a bunch of drug dealers and haul them into court. Uh, they're, they're always gainers. All of these measures involve people who are not always employees of the government, but, but nonetheless indirectly serve the government when it responds to these threats. So fear-mongering is, uh, is certainly not a monopoly of the government. Uh, anybody can try that, but, but you notice what they're trying to do is bring about a certain use of government power. It's fairly uncommon for people to go out and try to stir up fear and, and then 
their solution doesn't involve government at all. You know, do an exercise here. I used to be a professor. I'll give you an exercise. Uh, as an exercise, you know, try to make a list of 10, 10 instances of private individuals or groups fear-mongering in a way that doesn't involve government. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's due on Monday. <laughs> I think you'll have trouble, frankly, because... As I said, the ideology of this country, and for a long time has been, the government is the problem solver of first resort. Most people don't even think about any other way to deal with what they perceive to be a serious problem. The first thing they think about is, serious problem? What should government do? And you notice, all the politicians, when they talk about these things, talk about it the same way. At one, at one point, Bush himself, uh, you know, he was pretending to be a conservative, and he kind of blurted out, government has to solve problems for people. Like, wow, Edmund Burke would have been befuddled by that. Uh, government's got to solve problems for people. You know, people are children. They're incompetent. They're fools. Thank God for government officials who are smart and competent <laughs> uh, and know how to solve problems. They have a proven record, all right? Look at all the problems they've solved. Wow, it's impressive. Yes. I'm half a foreigner in a way, but what you've said I think is basically true of a good many governments. But what can the poor general populace like us, what recourses do we have to counteract any of this? I mean, it's even come down to where parental rights are being mm -hmm. eroded. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, what can be done about it is, uh, in, in a way, there are many things, and another, that they don't amount to much. Uh, I frankly am, am not the right person to answer that question because I, I've never purported to have the answers to how we get out of this situation. Indeed, I don't think we can, but you don't want to hear that. Uh, uh, I try to remind myself as a historian that, that uh, things have been bad in the past sometimes. I mean, human beings have been in worse fixes than they're in today in the United States, that's for sure. And, uh, and they got out of them. So it's possible we'll, we'll find a way to get out of, of this fix too. Uh, but I don't have a formula for that. What I do always recommend to people is that they... Um, they take individual measures. Okay? Uh, I've, I've recommended to, to many younger people that they immigrate, that they leave this country, because uh, I think the country will, will be a much worse police state soon. Uh, if, I, if my personal situation permitted it, I would, I would leave myself, because I, I don't think this is going to be a good place to be uh, very soon. It's not a good place for many people already, but I think it's going to be a horrible place uh, down the road. And so one thing people could do would be leave the country. Now the problem with that is that you got to go somewhere and the place you go is probably going to be bad too. <laughs> so th those recommendations usually get around to what I think is the least bad place somebody could go and uh, uh, I, I won't go into that here. But there, there are other things that you can do to protect yourself. Basically we can all try to stay out of harm's way as best we can. Uh, uh, of course, w we should all avoid doing anything that encourages these processes. Okay? We, we should, anytime we have an opportunity, speak out against what's being done. Uh, we, sh we should denounce the people who are doing these things. We should do anything we can to create a climate of opinion in which these evils are recognized and condemned publicly. Because one of the things we know, um, in retrospect, uh, particularly from, um, uh, from um, some um, excellent work by Timur Karan, um, uh, who's now at Duke University, um, uh, was at USC for a number of years. Uh, Timur analyzed a number of uh, episodes uh, in history 
in which a sudden change had taken place. Uh, regimes were overthrown, for example, all at once, when people had thought they were strong, that they would last forever. And uh, the way the communism came down in, in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, for example, but there have been other, other abrupt changes that have happened like that as well. And uh, what he argues, and I think correctly, is that very often uh, when there's a situation that's uh, uh, tyrannical or oppressive, uh, people for good reason are afraid to speak out. And so in public, they, they say things that are positive about the regime or about the actions of the regime. They, they actually sound as if they support it and favor it. And that, that's just self-protection because you know, if you're in Cuba or if you're in Czechoslovakia and you know, under communism, there's certainly going to be an informant nearby. Your neighbor's probably an informant or somebody passing by on the street may be an informant. All of these, all of these highly controlled societies were riven with informants. And so people had to protect themselves by never speaking or acting in a way that, that, uh, that gave way their true beliefs. Even, even if they hated the regime and they hated its actions and they wanted more than anything to see it overthrown, uh, they dared not tell anybody but their most trusted friends, and usually only family members did they trust. Uh, I, I, I remember one friend of mine who was from Prague who told me that, that when, when, when she and her mother and father spoke in their apartment, they would go to one side of the apartment and speak softly because they knew the neighbor on the other side of the wall they, they, they went away from was an informant. Uh, and so, you know, people had to be very careful. Uh, but what happened in some of these places is that, that in one way or another, a dissent began to be expressed. And when someone had the courage to stand up and express dissent, then you know, people recognize he's saying just what I think. And then a few others ha had the courage to join and say, you're absolutely right. You're right. This is, this is horrible. These things are wrong. This government should be changed. And, and then it snowballs. Suddenly, there, there, there's a, a, a cascade of effect. And you, you have, in a very short time, gone from condition in, in say the che Czechoslovakia where hardly anybody will even speak out against the regime uh, a couple of years later there are tens of thousands of people marching down the main streets in Prague demanding that the regime step down and succeeding succeeding because there's so many of them what are the police going to do arrest millions of people they can't do that they were just overwhelmed but this happened quickly so the, the possibility always exists that, that people are just cowed. They're cowed by social pressure. They're cowed by not wanting to look foolish. They're not wanting to you know, stand up in public and sound like Robert Higgs. I mean, <laughs> who would? But, uh, uh, but they may still think those kinds of thoughts. Eh? Uh, it, it's not good form. You, know, you may lose the invitation to a cocktail party, but it, when people find the courage to stand up and, and, and say black is black and white is white, uh, then it may spread, and it may spread remarkably fast in certain circumstances. Um, we've had a litany tonight of uh, things that the government shouldn't do, mm -hmm. or if they're doing it, they're doing it for wrong reasons. Right. What do you consider legitimate government functions? Mm -hmm. Well, that's easy for me because uh, I, I don't believe there are any legitimate government functions. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just am opposed to government as we know it, which is the government uh, coerced submission. And so uh, I consider that criminal and wicked, and everything that flows from it is wrong. Uh, that doesn't mean that every action the government takes is a wrong action. Government does all sorts of things that in themselves are fine. They're, they're great. They're wonderful. But it, do, it does this with money. It gets from people by threatening to kill them, although they're innocent of any wrongdoing. That's wrong. And so this kind of government is wrong. It's just wrong. I don't believe in it any longer. It took me almost a lifetime to reach this position. 
if, if things are worth doing, people will find voluntary ways to do them. I honestly believe that. And I believe the ways they find will work better than having these uh, mendacious, incompetent buffoons with guns try to be the problem solvers for society. Uh, th we can all see the product of that. This is not a good way to run things. It, it, it perpetuates problems rather than really solving them. So my, my answer is just run away from this and uh, build a society on the basis of free and voluntary individual cooperation. Um, I want to thank um, Bob for ending on a, what uh, could be called a natural law um, position. And as you may remember, that uh, the, uh, the founders of this country were all subscribers to the idea of natural law and natural rights. And uh, the Declaration of Independence was inspired by that tradition. And uh, we're very grateful for Bob for being a scholar who is standing up and challenging uh, others to join with us in that regard. So um, copies of his book are here. If you haven't gotten one, we hope you will. They're next door. I'm sure Bob would be delighted to autograph copies. If you'd all join with me in thanking him again for his talk and, and, and so forth. And I also want to thank all of you for joining with us, especially on a sort of a dreary evening. Um, and um, uh, we hope that you'll join with us for our next event. Uh, thank you for coming. Good night. <laughs>